This is a breakdown of how I made this sci-fi space ranger character. I had a lot of fun with this one. It took about a day to complete, dipping in and out of the project. If you want to learn to make characters like this, then you can purchase my character pack, three courses in one for only $25. So the whole process as always starts off with a quick sketch. You can see it's fairly rough, but the closer you can get to your final result, the quicker your modeling stage is going to be. I use the guides to make sure things are lining up with the side view and the front view. And I kind of sketch how I model. I start out with sort of circles and blobs and then refine them over and over again. I grab and move areas around if I need to, and I usually end up with something that I'm happy with. I wanted to go for a sort of cute, but sci-fi old school style Space Ranger character. At that point, we jump across the Blender and we bring in our reference images. I make them slightly transparent, so they're not too distracting, and move them behind and to the side of where I'm going to model. Then I use my technique of blobbing out again. And these are just icospheres, perhaps scaled and stretched a bit to match the reference image. It's important to keep looking at both side view and front view so you don't have a really flat character. But I find this is the quickest process for each character that I do. The fingers I separate into different knuckles and I only create one so that I can quickly copy it to the other ones. Often if it's a hard surface, I'll actually box model it rather than use these blobby techniques. That gets me much closer to the final shape without too much editing and sculpting. Sculpting hard surfaces can be quite tough so it's usually easier to model them in the way I'm doing here. For any character that has kind of skin type clothes, you don't need to model separate clothes. You can just model the base body of that character and then turn them into clothes quite easily. I use a mirror modifier for any parts that obviously are symmetrical across the other side. And I do a little bit of refining to make sure it's matching up a bit closer to the reference images and I don't need to do too much work in the detailed sculpt. The next stage then is to do a more detailed sculpt. So you up the resolution and block out the features like you can see me doing for the face here. To remesh, you do this in sculpt mode and you press R to set the voxel size or the density of your mesh and control R to remesh. I think it's really important to keep the resolution quite low. If you had lots of detail, it might slow down your machine, but also your smooth brush isn't as responsive because it's smoothing out lots of vertices together. So for big editing of your shape, you have low resolution. When you're editing minor details, that's when you have higher resolution. Don't be afraid to move around your blocks at this point to make sure they're in line with the reference. I don't join any of them together just yet. I wait till the end when I've got all the shapes where I want them to be, and then I start joining. You do, however, want your shapes to overlap quite a lot in the way a muscular structure would. So think about how the arm joins to the body, the shoulder kind of overlaps the arm and the body. At this stage, I do join the finger sections and the thumb sections together to make one object that I can easily duplicate. This is probably the most time consuming part of the process. This character hasn't gotten any particularly difficult clothing items, so this was the most time consuming part. Sometimes that can be more time consuming when you've got very detailed items to add to the character, such as complicated clothing or something like that. Now here you can see me sculpting the top part of the boots. Yes, they are a hard surface aspect, but I felt like it was going to be a little bit easier to get the shape by sculpting them and then remeshing them later. It's basically just the preference thing this. I find it easier to sculpt than I do to box model. For the hand, I duplicate the fingers and obviously resize them, curve them around a bit as a natural hand looks. I sculpt the base part of the hand and then join all those pieces together and then do a further sort of smoothed out sculpt. You do need to make sure that before you do that remesh where you join those objects together, that the fingers are separated a bit so they don't sort of merge together when you do a remesh. Now at this point, I'm starting to join together the body aspects, so the arms and the legs and so forth. Of course, I'm applying the mirror first before doing that. I was slightly toying with the idea of keeping the arms separate and having some sort of joining aspect like a shoulder band or something so you couldn't see the join, but eventually I just joined them together anyway. And once they're all joined like this, I can do a bit of a tidy up, sculpting out a bit more of the details. You don't have to go too far with the detailed anatomy because this is supposed to be a suit that's over the top of the character's body. I kept the head as a separate object because I probably want to go a bit more detailed with the features here. It's important to get the eyeballs into position, especially with these stylized characters. 
the eyeballs can be quite hard to sculpt around because they're so big, and they're just basic UV spheres that are mirrored across from one side to the other. Again, I'm not going too detailed too early, so I've got a low resolution to make the big changes. I never go particularly high with the resolution because again, you don't need that much detail with this sort of character. Some of the features are going to be painted on. And later I retopologize this so it's quite a low resolution mesh and do most of the details through texture painting. I decided to bring the helmet in at this point as well to make sure that the head fit within the helmet and it was going to link up to the body having enough neck length and things like that. I was a touch concerned about the rigging aspect of this as well, but we come to that later. At this point comes the retopology, so I'm using the quad remesher, and I'm taking my detailed mesh and turning it into a low poly mesh. If this was a highly detailed sculpt, then I'd probably need to do some baking of the high poly to the low poly, but it didn't matter in this case. And you can see I'm separating the hands with a kind of glove end, so I can remesh the hands separately from the body, and therefore have a higher topology where there's a bit more detail. Another reason why it's helpful to have a separate face as well, so I can have higher detail there too. So as I mentioned earlier, I used the sculpting technique for the boots instead of a hard surface approach, but now I'm remeshing, I can easily take those more hard surface box modeling approach and start remapping it to a better, more structured shape. So the remesh in this scenario is actually helping me to get the right shape I need for this sort of hard surface structure. Sometimes I have to go in and tidy up the mesh that the remesh does because the topology doesn't flow particularly well for edge loops, but usually that's fairly straightforward. And here you can see me starting to add some details to items such as the boots. So I'm adding a kind of buckle and a support and I'm just using a shrink wrap technique so they're sticking to the mesh. Then I use a solidify modifier to bulk them out. That's often my technique when doing clothing is to use a shrink wrap and a solidify modifier so it matches the shape of the body and the solidify adds some bulk. The backpack is a simple box that's been subdivided and for the oxygen pipe I used a curve. I'll talk a little bit more about that later though. The gun was very fun to model, it's quite easy in a sense, you just take a cube, subdivide it and add lots of loop cuts to get the shape. The extra bits like the handle and the sort of weird swoopy bits are just added separate objects and again box model those, add a subdivision surface modifier and kind of place them within it. It's a little bit easier to keep them as separate objects and just overlap them like this. They can have different modifiers, you can texture them more easily and you can just parent them all to an empty if you want to move them all around together. To model the hair, I usually do the outline of the hair either by sculpting or box modeling like this, and then sculpting. And then I use curve objects to add sort of strands of hair to give it more detail. Now to add detail to the pipe, I first thought I'd just add a bevel to my curve, but it didn't look quite right. It needed that lumpy flexi pipe look. So I created a torus and used the curve modifier to make it go along the curve. You must remember with that is that you need your object at the beginning of the curve to make sure it follows along the curve. For the texturing there's nothing particularly special, it's just texture slots and the basic principle BSDF. I always have an HDR in the background, one I might roughly use to get the right idea about the lighting. I do unwrap and texture paint the face which I'll talk about next. So you can see that the face is lacking a bit of detail because I want it to be low poly and easy to animate. So I unwrapped it using a smart UV project and that way I can paint on the details such as the lips and the eyelids and all those sort of things. I wasn't entirely sure that this was going to work because it was quite a low poly shape that I used the quad remesher to make, but the end result turned out quite nice. For things like the eyebrows and the eyelids, I just modeled those, often using the snapping and shrink wrap technique and then shaping them and putting them in position. Now it's rare, but Blender did actually crash on me at this point and I lost my texture painting for the face because I hadn't had the texture saved, but I was able to recover the file at least. So this is the second stage of the hair where I start sculpting out this sort of blob that I've got, and then I start adding the curves afterwards to give it more detail. For the hair curves, I use just a bezier curve, but I have a curve object or a bevel object which is that circle next to it, and you tick in the box under bevel, you choose the object 
and I choose that circle to get the shape of the curves and then I can just easily position them over the hair. This is the one part where I feel like I should have gone a lot further, done a lot more curves. I think I'd just about get away with it with a final model as we're not getting up close, but if I were to go further with the model, this is where I would put most of my effort. I put a few minor strands at the back as if it's sort of a little bit frizzy where the kind of top knot ponytail thing is. Tiny features like that can help give it a little bit more realism. The next stage is to bring in my Rigify rig and start matching up the bones to my character. With a Rigify rig, you have this base rig and then you generate a Rigify rig from this, which is quite complicated and has lots of IK features and things like that, which help you in the posing process. It's always the fingers that take the longest and I use the snap to volume technique to match those up. Once it's all in place, we're ready to parent our character to the bones. Now there is a bit of tidy up I'm doing here. I'm turning down my subdivision surface modifiers so they're not so complex. That can help speed up sluggish systems. Also, I'm connecting things like the hair and the hair strands to the top bone. It's easier than using automatic weights. And I'm doing a bit of weight painting as well. You can see on the head there and the eyebrows, I'm changing those around to make sure that the weight is perfect. There wasn't too much weight painting to have to worry about, which was nice but I'd probably put a little bit more effort in if I wasn't just doing a single pose for the character. To hook up the gun to the character, I select all the gun objects and parent them to an empty, and then the empty I parent to the hand bone. So when the hand moves, the empty moves, and therefore the gun moves. I'm finding this is the best way to do weapons these days. Then it's a case of trying to pose the character into a nice position. The hardest bit tends to be the fingers, trying to wrap them around a handle is always tough. The Rigify rig is quite nice because you can scale the fingers to close them and then you can just rotate them slightly to make sure they match up to your handle. The finger bones are independent of the hand bone so you can actually grab them a little bit and move them around as well if you need to. And because my weapon is attached to an empty, I can easily adjust the position of the whole weapon as well in the hand. Then I start positioning the body, but at that point I realized I might need some shape keys in there for the face and things, so I jumped to that. So firstly, what are shape keys? Well, they're a way of editing your shape without using bones. You can actually edit the topology, so go into edit mode, move things around, or into sculpt mode and move things around. This creates two keys, so one for your base position and one for your edited position, so my shocked expression in this case and to animate, I can blend between the two for different expressions. Some people use this for facial animations, other people use bones. Bones can be a bit faster, but I find shape keys give a little bit more character. The other nice use of shape keys is to sort out any pinching in the topology when the rig isn't quite weighted how you want it to be. It's not really used for game characters, I don't think you can export shape keys, but it's used a lot in animations, it gives nice realistic deformations but it can take a lot more time. I'm just jumping ahead a little here to show you how I used shape keys for the pinching in the leg. The leg wasn't quite deforming in the correct place, so I went in and did a bit of sculpting with a shape key so I could position it correctly, and then I could easily blend between the two if I were animating. So I've jumped back again to me posing, and you can see the leg is slightly deformed there. This is before I set up the shape key. It took a fair bit of time to get the pose that I was happy with, it's sometimes a good idea to actually set up your camera if it's just a still pose, so you know exactly what angle you're looking from. Also, I needed to go in and just edit some of the weights for some of the objects, especially those that are added on to the clothing. For the tentacle, I used a curve object, and I finally decided to set up the camera at this point because I needed to see where it was kind of going off the camera. I kept the tentacle nice and simple, so it's just a curve, and to scale down the curve thickness, I added a bevel and then you use Alt S to scale each point. I again used a bevel object, so I had another curve that I changed the shape of to give the tentacle a kind of shape. I was thinking of putting suckers on it and perhaps that's something that I would do if I had a little bit more time. Setting up the helmet material was one of the hardest things. I tried lots of different things because I didn't really want to get the background HDRI reflection in there. But in the end, it was a simple fix of just choosing the right HDRI. 
And rather than concentrating on the HDRI for lighting, which is more common, I was actually thinking more about the reflections in the helmet. That meant I needed to focus on the lighting myself, and I just used a basic three-point lighting kind of setup. Because the helmet was so large, it was actually a little bit awkward to rig and position, so I did the same trick that I did for the weapon. I parented it to an empty so I could easily reposition it so it would definitely fit the head within. At this point, there was lots of tweaking of lighting and obviously the HDRI in the background as I was figuring that one out. It's a really good idea as well when you've finished or you feel you've finished the project to give it a break for a day or so and then come back to it if you can. I did have the opportunity to do that and it was quite nice because I could exaggerate the pose more as I felt it wasn't quite dynamic enough in its current state. And there we have it, the final output. The tentacle texture is just a magic texture, one that I rarely use but seems suitable in this case. And for the background, I always do those in Photoshop, it's much easier. If you have any questions about the process, then do comment below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.